devices. So today we're talking about risk management, um, particularly in terms of managing security risk within an organization. So this topic is um, very much on the procedural kind of management side of things um, rather than the technical um, you know, technical controls that you use within an organization. So, so, so for some of you guys, that'll be, um, you know, something that you're really, really interested in. And others of you that really want to know about actual technical controls on a computer and how to hack into a computer and all that sort of stuff, it might seem to be on the duller side of things. Um, but it is, it's an important aspect um, because within an, an organization, it's all about I mean, it all comes down to the bottom line, doesn't it? If you're, if you're within an organization and you're going to convince them to put some technical controls in, into place, the way you're going to convince them is by making a risk management argument that actually the cost investment of having me do all this stuff on your servers is better for you because the amount of money that you'll lose otherwise, you know, it's, it's going to save you money. Um, so that's what we're talking about. So how do you actually make the case to management or, or and how as someone in management or someone managing security, how do you make an educated decision about what you should be investing your money in? And how do you, you know, make a decision between two different alternative approaches? So the risk, the word risk is basically possibility of loss or injury. Um, usually what we're talking about is possible negative impact. So things that could happen that will be, that will be bad to, to our organization usually. Um, there are sometimes people are even more general than that. So the effect of uncertainty on objectives uh, and some business minded project managers and things will talk about positive risk, which is just the fact that something might happen that could be a positive thing. Um, so that's not usually the way that we would talk about risk. Usually it's something negative, but just keep in mind that some people use the word to, to mean an unlikely event that could be positive. So um, nothing to do with the justice system, but just weighing up options um, is that it, whenever we make a security investment, um, we're aiming to mitigate some kind of risk and it's a trade-off. So we're going to spend money to try and protect ourselves, to protect some kind of business asset. Um, and everything that a business does involves some kind of risk. So if you um, are putting a new security system in place, if you do it badly, you might actually cause more problems. So everything involves some level of risk and pretty much anything that an organization does is going to cost money. So actually, um, Making these kind of decisions is something that we do every single day of our lives. We're always making trade-offs. We're always deciding between alternative courses of action. But for better or worse, humans are really bad at making decisions. We're not very good at making accurate scientific judgments um, and weighing up alternative options because it's very easy to feel secure when you're not, and it's very easy to feel very insecure when actually you're very safe. Um, and part of that is the fact that we really exaggerate spectacular things and we underestimate things that are common. So for example, driving in a car, we don't think of it as being dangerous, but in fact, it's a lot more dangerous than, th than some things that we're always scared about. So you might be scared about, I mean, some people will balk at a bag that's been left unattended in a public <coughs> transport place, for example. Oh no, look out, there's a bag, it could be a bomb. Like, just don't say that out loud. Um, and yet you're happy to hop in a car, and which is probably more dangerous. Um, driving in a car or a bag that's been left at a train station, probably the driving a car <coughs> is actually a lot more dangerous, but it, it might not seem that way because you're so used to it. So it's a, magnet, it's a matter of cognitive biases. So things that are unfamiliar or extreme and out of your control, they are... Um, they can scare you, whereas familiar, typical, and in your control, so if you're the one behind the wheel, you might feel more safe than the person sitting next to you in a car. When something happens and you slam on the brake, you might be a bit worried, but the person next to you is going to be a lot more scared because they're not the one in control of that situation. And it's the same thing with like terrorism. So we often overestimate 
the um, you know the the likelihood and impact that um, a terrorist attack is going to have, um, and we might think things through in crazy movie threat kind of ways. So, <laughs> but what if the terrorist had a bomb strapped under a baby? So we better check people walking through security gates with babies strapped to them in case there's a bomb there, kind of thing. It's like you know it's really unlikely, but people are thinking like, what are these old unlikely scenarios that could happen. And as soon as someone comes up with, with one of those ideas, the, the, um, the natural reaction of a human being is to actually do everything you can to stop that. Um, and often by forgetting about all the other things that could go wrong and all these other security problems that we need to consider, but you just get focused in on this movie plot idea with what if there's a bomb in this situation and then they send all of this effort to actually try and stop that from happening. And the result of that can lead to something known as security theater, uh, which is a term that was originally um, coined by um, Bruce Schneier. But basically, it's where you've got flashy security. It's not actually cost effective, and it doesn't actually make us that, mu that much more secure than if we didn't have it. So for example, after 9-11 happened in US airports, there were um, reports <laughs> of a lot of um, security guards holding big, heavy artillery, machine guns, and stuff. But Allegedly, those guns weren't actually loaded with any ammunition. Um, so they're there as a deterrent and probably a deterrent against something that's incredibly unlikely to happen, like oh, the next day someone's going to board another airplane. You know, it's like it's quite unlikely, but people feel, felt scared, so it was there to make fe people feel better, even if it didn't actually do that much in terms of improving security. So something you want to avoid when you're designing a security system. Um, so it helps to be aware of all these biases and try and fight our um, inner raging monkey brain that just wants to make these like snap decisions and instead try and get some hard figures and some hard facts in order to make these decisions so that you're actually making an educated decision about things and not some React, reaction and making a decision based on that. Uh, so I do actually recommend watching um, this uh, clip by Bruce Schneier and he does quite a good talk. Uh, it's a TEDx talk. Um, I'm not going to put it on now because it does go for 20 minutes but um, if, you, if you're interested then I would recommend that. So risk management is the art and science of identifying, analyzing and responding to risk. So an organization is going to face all kinds of risks and risk management is where you figure out what to do about it. Identify the problems and decide what your course of action is. So the kinds of risks faced by organizations will include things like project management risk. So again, it's you know, not specifically to do with security, it's just one of the risks they face is every time they have a project, something could go wrong, the project could lose money. Investment risk, maybe they're going to lose money on the, you know, the share, share market or you know, stock market or whatever. Budgetary risk, legal liability risk, safety risk, someone could get hit with a sledgehammer when they're walking to work. Inventory risk, something you know, could get stolen or you know, supply chain risk. <clears throat> and one of the risks that an organization faces is security risk. So, you know, just keeping things in perspective, there's all kinds of risks that organizations face. Security is one of them. Uh, so a, a quote from um, NIST um, Special Publication 839. Leaders must recognize that explicit, well-informed risk-based decisions are necessary in order to balance the benefits gained from the operation and use of information systems with the risk of the same systems being vehicles through which purposeful attacks, environmental disruptions, or human errors could cause mission or business failure. So basically, we need to, um, any organization nowadays is probably going to involve like IT infrastructure. They're going to have some computers involved. And what that means is almost every organization needs to think about security in terms of like technical, um, you know, computer security, network security. And what that means is all of you guys have fruitful careers ahead of you. Because you know all these companies are going to need to figure out what their security stance is. And some of that they're going to have in-house and some of that they're going to um, you know, outsource. 
But in order to make these decisions, um, they're going to have, you know, whoever's making, doing the risk um, management needs to make um, judgments about what's important to that organization. You know, look at strategic planning. So for this organization, what are our goals? And, um, you know, how are we going to run our business? So how operationally, how are we going to implement the security controls that we need uh, in order to protect ourselves against the risks that we face? So it's only going to work if someone in management at management level is has an interest, right? If you've got someone doing risk management and they're not talking to someone like the CEO or someone, you know, within a few layers of organizational hierarchy away from the CEO. If you're so far down the organizational hierarchy that, you know, that this is being communicated to, to like executive level, then it's very hard to succeed. Um, basically, to work properly, you need management to actually care. Um, and they need to be accountable for the risk management. Um, so that you can set up like an organizational wide risk management program and so that you've got the resources that you need to do it properly. And part of that process is talking to the big, big wigs, the people at the top of the organization to determine levels of risk. Like what is an acceptable level of risk for you? Because everyone has a different, a different level of risk that they're willing to take. So for example, if I asked you guys whether you, um, I don't know, I'll flip a coin. If it comes up heads, I'll double your money. Uh, sorry, I'll, I will give you um, a third extra of what you originally invested or something. Is that a risk that you're willing to take um, or not? For some people, okay, say, say I will double your money if it comes up the same amount, but you need to give me 100, 100 pounds right now and I'll, I'll double it if it comes up heads. <laughs> Show of hands, how many of you will go for that bet? All right, that's not many of you. Um, so I guess it's whether or not you've got 100 pounds that you're willing to um, to put to risk. The odds, those odds aren't bad. 50-50 is it's not great, but it's better than you'll get at any casino. Um, so because you know, otherwise the house wouldn't always win. Um, even on roulette, you know, you've got the red and black and couple of other ones that don't count. I mean, zero, double zero, and is it triple zero? Yeah, single zero. Sorry? Or just single zero. Single zero, and there's two, two zero ones. There's like the zero and the, yeah, anyway. So there's two, there's two numbers that can come up that don't count towards a 50-50. So even if you're just betting on red or black, you've got less than 50% chance of winning. So, but anyway, so that's, <laughs> so it's all about risk tolerance, right? So different people are willing to risk different amounts of things. And as the person doing the risk assessment, in fact, it's not your judgment. I mean, it's partly your judgment, but you need to ask the CEO level, kind of like executive level of the organization, what risks are they willing to take? Because it's their, well, more or less their money. So they're the ones that are accountable for the things that happen to the organization. So there are standards you can follow that help to make sure that you're actually doing risk management in a way that makes sense. So um, there's ISO standards, um, so 27,005, which is 2011 information technology, information security risk management, and there's the NIST uh, special publication uh, 839, managing information security risk. And pretty similar. In, in similar ways, they provide a framework for an organization to manage their risk. They don't actually specify exactly what you should do and what processes you should follow, but they do say that you should consider this and you should, you know, in basically the stuff that I'm talking about in this lecture is the kinds of things that they recommend that you do. So that you're following, um, you know, best practices in a way. So it's, you know, actually doing risk management is a never-ending continual process where you, you start by doing some strategic planning. So, you know, you talk to the to to them to make the decisions about what are the things that we're trying to protect within your organization, how much of it is it worth to you, what kind of risk are you willing to take, and then you assess what the risks are, what could go wrong, identify the problems that could happen. And then you plan responses to those problems. So what are you going to put in place in order to stop those problems? Um, and you'll continually monitor 
um, the way that you're doing risk management within the organization and possibly reassess and redesign the way that you do your risk management. So here's an example. Um, so I'll get you guys to, to, to give some examples of some threats that this organization might, might face. So for a case study, we've got an online retailer, say something along the lines of uh, not, not Amazon, but like a smaller um, organization where they sell stuff online, like an e-commerce website. They've got a website, they've got online shopping, they accept credit card payments from their customers. They store all the details of transactions in a database, which is quite normal, and they provide a mailing list for customers so that people can sign up to get specials and deals sent out to their, to their emails. What could go wrong? Yeah. Um, man in the middle attack between the customer and the server. Yeah. What's what and what what's the worst thing that could happen in that situation? Yeah. Yeah. Get all the credit card details. That's bad because it's not the organization's money. Yeah. Yeah. They lose customers and reputation and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Other threats. A skill injection attack. So, yeah, there might be a specific like programming error in the website that allows them to inject code and yeah, access the database and change it. And, yeah. Other ideas? Denial of service. Denial of service. Yeah. So you know someone could take that organization's you know servers offline basically by you know maybe overwhelming them. So I'll stop. We'll stop there because actually uh, next week's lab a, um, tutorial session is actually you analyzing this case study and, and writing up a proper like risk assessment of this scenario. So there's a few there's some starting points of things to think about. So um, strategic planning. So in order for it to work, um, you know you need to talk to the to management decide. You know, what's the acceptable level of risk? What trade-offs are we willing to make? Um, how are we actually going to organize it within the, orga within the organization? How is it governed? Who makes the decisions? And what are the constraints? So for example, management can sometimes have some funny ideas. They might just say, we will do this. And um, you know, th this, you pick your battles. <laughs> it might not be worth arguing if they say, uh, yeah, for um, we will definitely be using a web application firewall. You say, do you know what that means? No, but someone told me it was a good idea. It's like, all right. Well, you know, if so if if the CEO is saying that, you know, that's fine. That that's just part of the decision making process. Okay, we've got that as a solution. Uh, you know, what else are we going to do? Uh, or they might say, uh, well, we don't actually care about like security that much. So do the bare minimum that's best practice or something like that because actually we're a startup company. And we don't want, we can't afford to invest too much in security. So just tell me what's the bare minimum I need to spend in order to avoid like this, this, or this. So you get those constraints from them before deciding, you know, where to go to next. And then for an actual organization, um, there's something known as uh, enterprise architecture, which is basically like a big document or this planning process that decides how the organization's structured um, and how the the organizational procedures and things work. Um, but the idea of this document is to actually show clearly how the investments actually provide measurable um, outcomes, and um, in, that includes security investments. So we'd say like we're investing this much in security, and it's designed to mitigate these risks. So you have that as part of that documentation. But having having those kind of um, procedures in place afterwards kind of helps to ensure that you've actually got a consistent approach across the whole organisation. But also, you can separate different business units. So, for example, you might say, um, you know, this the financing business unit. Its goals in terms of security is this, this, and this. And you know, this other business unit is designed to do something else. And then, from a security point of view, you can actually look at those individually as individual problems to solve. But also um, redundancy. So you can look at things like designing into the, the fact that you're actually going to have servers that fail over onto other servers and things like that, um, which we'll talk about in more detail another week. So um, within that, you might have an information security architecture, which again is just like a policy document that describes within the organization 
um, you know, how the security is going to be done. And you would plan things like what is the administrative controls we're going to put into place, what are the technical controls and what are the physical policies uh, and procedures and, and things like that that we're actually going to put into place. Um, and we're going to actually ensure that certain security requirements are, are achieved and are cost effective. So in order to do this, we need to start off by figuring out what are our security requirements. If we've got an organization, what do we need to do? Part of that, what are you legally obliged to do? Because you can't just have no security. If you are handling um, certain sensitive information, then you're obliged, you know, under um, was it principle seven of the uh, Data Protection Act in the UK that says that you need to use a reasonable uh, level of security to, you know, technical controls to secure stuff that you that you have. So there are legal obligations. Um, there are, you know, regulations. So, for example, if you accept Visa or Mastercard stuff, then you know they will, uh, you know, tell you that you should be PCI compliant, and you know you, you have a, a set of things that you should be adhering to if you're accepting and processing their credit cards. Um, and, you know, and you have standards like the ones that I just mentioned, and um, you know the organization might have its own policies and things so you need to consider all of that in order to decide what is what are we actually aiming for and then we want to actually mitigate the risks that we've identified so these are the problems um, and at a bare minimum we can use best practices which is basically the standard way that things are done so for example as a standard people have a firewall if you didn't have a firewall for example on your boundary between your network and the outside internet, then you'd be insane. And everyone would, if you did get hacked, people would argue that you weren't following best practices. From memory, allegedly Sony, when they had the, the PlayStation network hack, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't, they did not even have a firewall or something like that. They, were, they weren't encrypting passwords. That's they weren't encrypting passwords. So that's best practices like that. At, you know, people should at least be storing a hash instead of like plain text passwords and things like that. So yeah, so they're doing some things that weren't best practices. It wasn't at the standard level. So at bare minimum, you want to be doing what everyone else is doing. Um, but you can't just do what everyone else is doing. You need to be doing stuff that other people are doing that actually makes sense in your context. Because, you know, if everyone was... Oh, it's like what your mum says. If, if oh, but Tommy was doing it. Yeah, but if he jumped off a cliff, would you follow him or something? You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So you you want to know that you've got actually got a reason for doing it, um, and then you you you'd actually document what the risks are. So you need to identify what the threats are and the vulnerabilities are, and that's technical and non-technical. Um, so you know what you guys said before, things like um, your cre customers' credit cards being stolen. That's, that's like a non-technical problem that you want to avoid. And SQL injection is a good example of a technical attack that you want to avoid. So the, these are the things that you need to think about when you're coming up with the, the security solutions. <coughs> so um, you want to actually identify what the impact of those threats are. So what would happen in those situations? Say, for example, we only had money enough to solve one of those two problems. The, the fact that credit cards can be stolen with a man in the middle attack or the entire database could be written and accessed with an SQL injection attack. If those are the two things that we had to weigh up and decide which one are we going to do, I don't know, which one would we do? What do you think? Those are the two. Though you're faced with those two security options. You can't afford to do both. His manager said, here you go, here's a tenor. So I picked the security problem. Which of those two <coughs> solutions are you? What, what? Larger solutions. So stopping a man in the middle attack. Uh, which could end up stealing credit card details of your customers, or stopping an SQL injection attack, which gives them access, full access to the database. Yeah, probably. I mean, obviously, you need to weigh up what the organization's requirements are. But yeah, it seems that that that's the that seems more important because actually, if they can get at the database, they can probably also get at credit card details. So if you're weighing those two up, then yeah, that's the one that you probably spend your money on. But again, that's part of the whole process is like figuring out all of these things. 
um, and deciding what's actually more likely. So a man in the middle attack requires a few steps to work, right? So the, the man in the middle actually needs to be in the network between these two systems, or they need to have access to, to the customer's machine. Um, whereas the SQL injection attack can be done by anyone on the network, so that's actually probably more likely if there is a coding error to be a problem. So, you know, uh, the, a calculation that's important here is risk management equals impact times likelihood. So if the impact that it would cause is high, but the likelihood was low, you know, you multiply that together and you come up with a risk magnitude. If both of them are high, obviously the risk magnitude is high, and both are low, then the risk magnitude is low. Um, and there's lots of different tools and things you can use to measure these measure these things. So how do you identify what your what risks you face? You can use brainstorming, so just sitting in a room trying to come up with ideas as a team, interviewing people. You can use source analysis. So for example, what are the sources of risks? You could say my customers could be a could be a source of risks. External hackers could be a source of risk. Uh, my customer, you know, so you're thinking of these different places that could cause a problem. Um, yeah, problem analysis. So, for example, losing money is a problem. How could that happen? Uh, losing, um, losing publicity, you know, getting bad publicity is a problem. How could that happen? Um, you can use common, common risk checking. So, what are the common things that happen? You can use objective base. So, what are our organization's objectives, and how could they be? Um, damaged by someone. So our objective is to sell stuff online. How could that go wrong? Our objective is, you know, to provide some service. What could, you know, how could that go wrong? Um, so you can use a risk breakdown structure, which is basically a taxonomy of risks. So you basically you break down hierarchy of the types of risks and um, you know the sorts of things that could lead to it. Uh, in this diagram, it's to do with project management risk, which is a little bit different. Attack tree is one way. So if you guys may have already done an attack tree this semester, um, but again, it's something that was invented by Bruce Schneier, uh, who, um, if you don't know who Bruce Schneier is, he was a cryptographer, and now he's um, he still does cryptography, but he it's very outspoken, almost like a media-facing security expert who's um, very um, very popular, and he's he's very well known for being practical and down to earth, and he's kind of broadened as his career has gone on. Um, but I do recommend his blog actually; it's quite good reading. But um, <coughs> so in a, but, so he invented a attack tree, which is basically just a list of all the ways someone could attack a system. Um, so the root node is the goal, and then all the leaves are all the different ways that could be achieved by an attacker. And there's, you can kind of superimpose information onto that diagram to show um, to show costs and things like that. Um, but it can get really complicated. So um, my PhD supervisor at my last university, part of his PhD research, he had like this attack tree that was just ridiculous. It was I don't know like hundreds of pages or something. Um, uh, yeah, so they can get quite complex, but they're good for just identifying the different ways the system could get attacked. So um, a tech tree, you can show it either as a graphical thing like this or as a list, which is actually what I recommend if you haven't done the attack tree task yet. Just use a list format with the numbering. Is, um, so if you read about it, you learn about it. Um, but, you know, because it can get quite big. So how do we determine likelihood? We can either look at quantitative stuff, so use actual hard numbers. Um, so, for example, what is the historically what's happened? What are the statistics of the capabilities of the people that we're facing, the attackers? What can what are they capable of? Uh, and actually use statistical analysis to just determine probabilities of, of how likely something's going to happen. That's like an ideal world is where you can actually do that. Often you don't have those kind of numbers, so you need to do qualitative, which is where you don't have you have to use your own judgment. So you might have it's a high risk, a medium risk, or a low risk, or a low likelihood, sorry. So it's, that's likely to happen or not likely to happen. That's still a lot better than just not knowing at all. So making a judgment about is, you know, how difficult it would be to exploit an SQL injection, for example. Uh, you can use prob probability impact matri matrices, a matrix to show impact and probability. Um, so you could either use this qualitatively or quantitatively. So, so for example, the risk of me um, 
getting angry and throwing that chair out of the window. Let's say that did happen. Probably unlikely. What's the likelihood that it would fatally injure someone when I throw it out the window? So if we're going to map that onto here, let's assume I am throwing a chair out of the window. Um, where do you think it falls on this in this chart? Medium. So probability for for causing a fatal injury. High. High. I'm not sure about that. I think if I throw a chair out of the window right now, oh, there's someone there. But I think there's probably lo low likelihood that I can kill someone. Could happen. An impact. Uh, the impact if I did kill someone. It's, yeah, it's pretty high. It's pretty high. Hopefully, we're insured against that. Uh, so yeah. So, so that, that, that so that it allows us to helps us to make decisions about things. If we can map out what the risks are and where they fall on that chart. So magnitude, um, risk magnitude again is its likelihood times impact. Um, so we might just rate it on a scale of one to ten, um, or we might have something more, you know, more uh, data to help. Annual loss expectancy, uh, also known as a good drink, uh, ale, uh, yeah, sorry, or um, estimated annual cost, e EAC, uh, is basically the, the impact, so that's like the money that it would cost uh, times the likelihood. Uh, so uh, you can use that to calculate how much money things cost, um, and it helps when you're talking to a manager if you can say, look, this is the, this is the annual loss expectancy. If this was going to happen, we would lose this much money, but we can invest in this thing and it costs this much, and you, know, you can actually make those decisions. So remember, costs can include direct and indirect. So you know, paying staff is obviously a big direct one, but there's reputation and um, you know all these other things that I talked about in the first week. So the sorts of things that could happen in an organisation: you might have a defaced website would be bad, compromised billing system would be bad, malware, you know, network routing altered. You might have network eavesdropping happening. Someone's listening in, like a man in the middle attack. Um, you know, passive. Passively could be monitoring a network. You could have denial of service attacks. You could have software vulnerabilities discovered in your code, like an SQL injection attack. You could have phishing targeted maybe at your employees or your customers. You could have brute force attacks against your servers, services. You might lose laptops, people that work for your organization. You might have um, keyloggers installed, and people might listen in on what your employees are doing. Uh, you might have employees accessing you know, things that aren't appropriate in the workplace. And all of these things are, um, you know, things that you'd need to consider. So, uh, and in, in each case, there'd be multiple ways you could deal with that. So you need to choose the appropriate course of action based on, um, you know, what uh, the organisation's needs. So we need to identify a course of action. So, say for example. Um, Throwing the chair out of a window. All right, we'll take, use that as the example for some reason. Uh, so we can either accept that risk, we can avoid the risk, we can mitigate the risk, we can share the risk, or we can transfer the risk. So accepting the risk is where we basically say, that's okay, we're willing to accept that that might happen. It's fine, go ahead, throw the chair out the window. It's unlikely to happen, but we won't worry about it. That's fine. We're willing to accept the small risk that, that is, go for it. Um, so something like a low risk event would be a good example where it's actually not worth trying to protect against it. Or we could actually go avoid the risk. So for example, don't do that then. Please stop throwing things out of the window. We're not willing to accept that, that, that risk. And the best way we can see to avoid that problem is actually for you to stop throwing chairs. Um, and you know, someone would have to sit me down and say, please stop throwing chairs out of the window. It's causing, you know, we're not, you know, you just you almost hit someone the other day. Please stop. So, for example, we might stop using a certain technology or providing a service or whatever. Mitigating the risk would be doing something to reduce the threat. So we hand out hard hats to people walking past. So, you know, if you're going to walk past this window, please put this hat on because chairs tend to fly. Um, so, for example, we might put in security controls or use some technical things. We might redesign our systems or whatever. We've got something in place to reduce the impact of something happening. We might share the risk. So we might outsource, work with another organization. Um, so we might say, um, 
Oh god, this this metaphor, this example doesn't work very well in this example. Um, so there's a business down the road. They also do a lot of share throwing. Um, if something happens, we'll share the, the impact of that happening. We'll, we'll pay the bills half and half or something. Um, risk transfer is where you basically make it someone else's problem. So for example, we'll just pay insurance so that if a share does hit someone, insurance covers it. Um, so so that, that, that's, that's basically the, the decision. So if we do get hacked, We've got insurance that's going to cover the, you know, the losses that we cause. So, um, so then we need to evaluate all these different um, alternative solutions to determine what, what we should actually do in the organisation. So obviously, you know, we need to. Um, they're not all going to make sense for our organisation. So um, there's another thing that we can use, which is total cost <coughs> of ownership. So that's how much is it going to cost to buy it and then operate this thing. The hard hats, for example, when we're not only going to have to invest in buying all the hard hats, but we need someone standing out there handing them out all the time. So, you know, we pay for licensing and hardware and all that sort of stuff. Um, so there's lots of costs that can be go into that equation. Uh, but then we can use that to, to look at the costs of all these alternative solutions. Um, and it might only make sense to mitigate the risk if the, the, um, the total cost of um, ownership is less than the annual loss expectancy. So if it costs more than we would lose, we might decide, well, actually, that's a bad investment. Uh, you can also use decision trees, which basically are ways of showing likelihood of different outcomes, and you can use that to make a decision. But it, eventually, we need to make a decision and just go for it and actually implement something and then figure out some way of monitoring uh, our systems and deciding whether or not we're doing it successfully. So, for example, you have you know, pen testing happening to test whether or not there's new threats that we haven't known about. We've got various vulnerability assessments and automated scanning and stuff, and we've got some way of monitoring for changes on the network so that we need to know whether or not we need to reevaluate our risk management. And uh, in conclusion, um, if you're interested in risk management, there, there is um, definitely it's a viable career. And um, you might be interested in reading a little bit more about it. So the NIST special publication 839 is actually quite a good resource. Uh, that's public domain if you want to read through it. And um, that's the end of what I have to say about risk management. Um, so I'll stop the recording.